I'd like to extend a special welcome to our All Access Pass attendees. Our All Access Pass is a 12-month subscription package that allows you and your staff access to over 30 live webinars and 250 archived programs, as well as a one-year subscription to Technology Transfer Tactics. You also get exclusive subscriber resources, such as sample agreements and policies, special reports, and more. You can schedule a no-obligation demonstration on how the subscription works on my direct line at 203-467-7963. Tech Transfer Central is proud to announce our newest monthly newsletter. Industry-sponsored research management is the first and only publication devoted to helping you expand and expertly manage this increasingly critical aspect of your university's research enterprise. Visit www.techtransfercentral.com, click on the newsletter tab, and request your free sample issue today. For those in the audience who are eligible for continuing legal education credits, today's program number is 5217. Please make note of that program number as some state bars require it for CLE submission paperwork and program attendance records. Let's go ahead and meet our session leader. Please give a big welcome to Lou Burneman, founding partner of Osage University Partners. Lou, thank you so much for being with us today. I'll now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Debbie, and um, hello all. I recognize some of the names of some of the participants here, and um, thank you for joining. Um, we're we're going to talk today uh, about um, pitches. Um, so I think what you could do to help your investigators um, prepare um, invention disclosures, uh, prepare proposals for um, innovation funds, proof of concept, seed um, funds, um, uh, to uh, translational research, for pitching to translational research funds, as, as well as the venture funding. Um, there is a chat box. Um, some of you may have been in some sessions that I've given uh, at Autumn and LES and other events, so please feel free to ask a question, and Debbie will keep a track on those, and, and we'll get to them. So um, let's start with uh, Eureka, um, and that Eureka is pretty important, right? And so most of our academic investigators have a ratchet dial, and they're turned all the way over to the Nobel laureate, right? And but once that's achieved then the issues become and monetary gain. Um, and so that's the approach we'll take here, right? Um, and so I'm having a bit of a challenge on moving the cursor. There it is. Um, but for each of these events, um, literally the Eureka is just the beginning. Um, most, many of you have seen uh, many of you have experienced that there's a major transition, um, in my view, going on uh, now where years ago, back when I was doing what you were doing, it literally was a fairly simple tech transfer process, hard uh, but straightforward. Um, and now we've progressed to where um, I believe that in the next few years what we're going to see is perhaps the most interesting, compelling, transformative, paradigm-shifting technologies being licensed into startups um, for early-stage R&D and de-risking development uh, prior to being then sub-licensed or collaborated. Um, and so the, the job of the tech transfer manager and research institution is really going to change. Uh, it's going to be helping investigators understand how to pitch, how to pitch for um, invention uh, disclosure support in terms of patenting because budgets are getting tighter for everyone, uh, how to pitch for translational research funds, and then how to pitch for uh, capital. Um, and so the first message is, the need to be clear, concise, and compelling. You'll hear me repeat that phrase um, ad nauseum uh, this afternoon. Clear, concise, compelling. 
um, and generating interest across each of those, including recruiting and entre entrepreneurial leadership or colleagues, uh, if you will, for translational research funding. Um, and there's a lot of sources for R&D funding, right? So if we look at the bottom, um, one of the reasons that I think technology is coming from um, research institutions do much better generally than technologies from the private sector is um, in terms of commercialization. Um, those technologies have been vetted um, by grant review bodies, peer review bodies for publications and the like. Um, and so uh, for us as an inventor at Osage University Partners, uh, we like to see that support. Uh, but now increasingly coming through the tech transfer, tech transfer office or other elements of the university um, and translational research funding organization, uh, there are now opportunities for proof of concept funds, seed funds, incubation funds, accelerator funds, all of that. Uh, and so this, if you will, is a taxonomy from bottom to top uh, of sources of dollars um, and it's important to understand the missions of each of these organizations um, and where they play in the funding cycle. So unless you're working with a rock star investigator who has had previous commercial success, uh, you almost need to plan on going through each of these steps from bottom to top, with the exception of crowdfunding, which really only has its place in uh, consumer products and generally, um, well, I was going to say consumer electronics, but that's getting broader now. So consumer products largely. And then the very top line strategics. Over the last five years, we've seen strategic, that is corporate venture arms, moving down and playing in the same space with venture capital. Um, I would guess that maybe about a third of our life sciences investment companies um, companies in which we've invested have a strategic uh, investor along with um, traditional venture capitalists. Um, so the cliche is true, you only get one chance to make a first impression. Uh, as you know far better than I, um, you all receive a, a large number of invention disclosures and um, few institutions have the financial and managerial resources uh, to support all of those um, certainly beyond the provisional stage. Um, but also, first chance to make a good impression to translational research funders um, and, and uh, other investors. And, and what I'm going to talk about today, I, I believe is true, whether it's the proverbial one minute in the elevator um, or a brief introductory PowerPoint or a two-page executive summary or a longer descriptive document or a full PowerPoint. Um, the need to be clear, concise, and compelling. Um, so it's important to understand that folks with capital receive a large number of opportunities, and their job, certainly at the entry point level, so associates, analysts, is to say no fast. They receive um, our analysts, uh, well, at Osage, we're probably looking at close to 500 new opportunities a year. Um, and, and our folks are trained and need to get to know fast so, it's, so they can spend time on the most interesting opportunities. Um, and so it's critical for you um, to teach your investigators how to make that good first impression and get past the no. So for an invention disclosure, obviously it's the scientist that's pitching. Um, and in my view, a, a science pitch, um, a great sci a PI pitch is, you know, where does this eureka fit into the landscape? Where could it go in terms of product opportunities? What are the next steps and what's the timing to get there? Um, and what kind of milestones are possible? When will um, you know at various stages whether things um, will become de-risked and there are um, future opportunities for commercialization? 
Um, in terms of translational research funding for incubation acceleration, angel funding, venture funding, um, it's the entrepreneur that ought to lead first with talking about the team. You're going to hear me say this over and over again, lead with the team. Um, I'll show you some data as we get into this that um, I think will be the evidence for why you want to lead with the team. Um, what are the key data? What's, what's, what are the data for that eureka um, moment that supports uh, the market product opportunity? Uh, what's the product development and commercialization plan? What's the timeline to move from point to point and how much money is needed? So that's the PI, I'm sorry, the entrepreneurial pitch. And the scientist, again, reinforces that by talking about experimental results, again, from the Eureka. Um, what are the next steps in de-risking? And finally, killer questions. I'm going to repeat killer questions a bunch over the next half hour. Those are the questions or the issues that have stopped or prevented the commercialization in similar approaches. So um, a previously undruggable target, um, an indication that has been plagued uh, with failures in the past, whether it's Alzheimer's or metabolic disease or whatever it is. But it, we think it's important to have that scientist address the killer question before it's asked. This is why we think we can overcome previous failures. So over in, in general, here are the pitching guidelines, and there's some redundancy here, I apologize. Uh, but first and foremost, don't call, call, no call, cold calling. Um, and even I would say this to an, uh, junior investigators who have never worked with tech transfer offices before. Um, come in through a colleague that you all have worked with, with a warm introduction, uh, because that's an, and, and, and a colleague perhaps where the office has successfully commercialized um, a technology, because that's going to move up to the, the, the top of anybody's pile. Um, but venture investing, angel investing is really a relationship business. We all talk to each other. We know each other. Um, we get lots of proposals, lots of pitches. Um, and so if you come in through a trusted friend and advisor, it's much more likely that the opportunity being presented is going to get attention, certainly going to get attention more quickly uh, than if it came through um, as a cold call. Again, preempt killer questions. Um, and don't send full decks. Um, save drive powder for the presentation being made, whether it's by the scientist um, or the entrepreneur and the scientist. Um, send brief decks, and we'll talk about mini decks in a minute, um, but save the full presentation um, for live discussions. Uh, follow good presentation guidelines, the most important being clear, concise, and compelling, and to pausing to allow time for questions making slides visually interesting, using text sparingly. Um, you'll note that I violate some of these rules in this presentation, and um, I didn't think about that until after uh, I looked at it in preparation for uh, today's call. Um, and finally, when you don't know uh, the answer to a question, admit that, don't try to bluff it, uh, and never try to hide anything. It's critical you tell your investigators uh, not to try to hide anything, because a good due diligence will reveal um, what's been hidden, and that will immediately reduce the credibility um, of, um, uh, of the presenters, of the entrepreneurs, of the founders. Um, so for invention disclosures, offices operate differently. Um, some offices spend time um, or prioritize these differently. Um, but certainly at, at, at Penn in Virginia, um, we looked at four things, right? Commercial potential, technical merit, protectability, and finally the inventor profile. Um, 
you know, there are just some folks that life is too short to deal with, and you got to know that going in, right? Some folks are just not going to be helpful, that are going to create problems. Um, you know, you may just want to release them early. Um, and it's in terms of inventor profile, I like to know up front to what extent the inventor is still working in this area, to what extent they're going to be helpful, uh, to what extent they're going to be willing uh, to assist. Uh, whether it's doing prior art searches, um, uh, making pitches, or the rest. But those are the four areas. And again, in addition to the one or two page disclosure form, talking about these four things perhaps in a brief PowerPoint or narrative uh, can be helpful uh, to researchers in getting support from the office uh, in terms of filings. Um, so five key elements of successful disclo disclosure from my perspective. Uh, the introduction, defining the problem and the solution, um, experience with prior patents, um, right, successes and failures, uh, and obviously successes in prior licensing activities. Um, market opportunity, we don't expect investigators to dig deep here, um, but we certainly, uh, I'd certainly want to know what the current solutions are to the problem um, being presented uh, and how this solution um, compares with uh, solutions currently in the marketplace. Uh, and then the most important section, certainly the largest section in my view, are what are the experimental results, right? Again, the Eureka. Uh, what are next steps? Is the investigator still working in this area? What do they have planned? Do they have funding uh, to continue to pursue uh, this line of investigation? Um, and, and seeing is believing, right? I mean, um, um, seeing the data, um, um, that led to this eureka moment. And then finally, the investigator's role. What are they willing to do? Um, what, are they, what are they able to do? How helpful can you be? Um, and so helping, you know, with um, early in the academic year, if you're doing investigators or if you have new investigator workshops in terms of introducing the office, uh, those are the areas that, that, um, that I suggest you focus on. Um, so now let's move into a, what I call a mini pitch, which is really a verbal presentation. This is the classic elevator, right? Um, very brief, what's the problem and the solution? Who are you working with, right? Uh, again, whether you're seeking for money, so what's the leadership team or translational research uh, activity and who else is involved in terms of a scientific advisory board. Um, it doesn't have to be just for a company, but who else is involved? What have they done in the past? What are their current positions? Um, how much are they going to be involved? And to what extent? And what roles? Um, again, I think that's where you start. Um, the market opportunity, again, addressable market. Again, an invest wouldn't expect an investigator necessarily to understand that. Um, but again, what are the current solutions, uh, which, which then you can back into uh, what's the addressable market? Uh, again, the largest section, the largest point of discussion here is, you know, the Eureka moment data, right? And seeing is believing, real data, talking it through. Uh, competition um, depends on the sector. So for technology opportunities, it's what's out there now, what are the current solutions? Uh, in the life sciences area, certainly for therapeutics, it's not necessarily what products are out there now because they're going to be old hat by the time um, a discovery stage academic invention uh, is fully developed. Uh, but who else is working on it, both in the academe and in the corp world? And then finally, um, how much do you need and how far will that get you? So then if we move into full decks, and these are decks that are going to be presented live. Again, you're going to want to use a miniature of this or a brief of, of this. Uh, it's sending in advance, but these are full decks for presentation. Again, you've got to grab attention with the introduction, problem, and solution. A couple of three slides on leadership, really important to show their backgrounds, um, what products um, they've helped develop in the past, um, what companies they've worked for uh, in the past, 
what successes they've had in product development and commercialization. Again, I'll show you some data in a minute, which reinforces why starting with leadership is so important. And then a couple of three slides on the market opportunity. Um, what's the scale of the problem you're looking to solve? Um, what's the present standard of care uh, or standard of solution in the tech space? Um, the product data, again, uh, the technology, um, the largest section of the slide, what are the experimental results that led to the Eureka moment, um, exactly where uh, you are in the product development process, and again, the opportunity here to difference this effort from previous efforts uh, that have not been successful. Competition, we've talked about uh, operational plans. Um, again, we've talked about financing strategy. How much do you need? How far will that get you? How much more will you need in subsequent rounds? Uh, over what time frame? Um, because those are the data that people will use to make a determination as to whether they should keep listening. Um, for example, when you're speaking to a venture investor, the first thing that that, invest, that analyst or associate's going to think about is, what could this thing be worth? Down the line, is this a $20 million activity, a $200 million effort, a $2 billion company? And then they're going to, the second question, if that number makes sense to them, is how much will it take to get there over what period of time? Those are critical questions, so you've got to have someone present the scale of the opportunity. Again, remember the approach here. You're presenting to people whose objective is to say no to you. And then finally, the summary. What could this opportunity become over what period of time? Um, tech, tech uh, pardon me, <coughs> excuse me. Tech decks are slightly different. Again, you start with the grabber problem solution. Leadership, again, critical. Market opportunity data become critical. Technology product data. Competition is more current, right, in the tech space where you have 18 to 24-month product life cycles, uh, again, is important. The operational plans. Financing strategy, things will move faster here. What's the financing history? How much uh, money has been obtained in non-dilutive financing and grants? How much has been obtained historically from friends, family, and founders? Um, you know, how much has been raised from angels? Uh, and what's the value inflection point? Where will this money take you? And is that truly an inflection point? And then finally, uh, the summary. So now let's transition to some lessons learned. Um, in, it's important to target investors strategically. Uh, different funds, different angel groups, institutional investors, venture funds all have strategic interests. Um, um, we all follow financing trends. We all tend to go into hot areas. So it's important to understand what areas the investor uh, likes and is strategically interested in and what stage of development of companies they fund. Not all um, um, venture investors fund across all stages, and I'll show you a couple of slides on that. Uh, again, you, it's important for you to help investigators who are thinking about startup opportunities um, understand the process, and unless they're a rock star, uh, this is gonna be tough. Um, it's a very good time to be raising money, um, 2015 was an outstanding year because the public markets opened up. 2016 was pretty good. 2017 thus far is shaping up to be a very good year uh, in terms of um, capital going into new opportunities. Um, we're often asked about the use of private placement agents to help you raise money. Um, if you're an academic um, and there is no CEO, that academic may need someone to help make introductions, um, but as again, it's the scientists, the founders gonna be needing to be central because um, all, inve all institutional investors are gonna wanna meet with that founder. Um, if a CEO has been retained, he or she should be able to fundraise. That should be a part of their track record of success. If, if that's not the case, you gotta rethink whether or not this is the right 
um, CEO. And then if there is no CEO, if you really have some transformative paradigm shifting opportunity, uh, but there is no CEO, it's really important for the investigator um, not to call themselves the CEO, because that's highly unlikely. Might call it the interim CEO or the founder, um, the interim manager, something that indicates to a potential investor that this is a science person who's gonna move aside for an industry domain experienced commercial person at the appropriate point in time. And so again, knowing the investors is important. So here in the life sciences area, um, there are a number of potential or a number of venture investors that will do uh, what I call complete assembly. That is start with science and do everything necessary to move it out of the lab uh, and into a commercial opportunity, including sometimes identifying, recruiting, uh, retaining a CEO. Other uh, funders start later in the process. Um, one things that are IND ready or even in the clinic. Um, and then if we go to the tech side, again, same thing. Um, some tech investors will start at the company formation stage. Others will be much later in the process. Um, so how to begin the VC journey? Um, again, the, the data suggests, and again, I'll show it to you, um, that a strong investable entrepreneurial lead uh, is the best path um, towards raising funding. And it's the team, and again, you'll see the data, um, that's critical. So if we just look in the small circle in the middle with one asterisk, uh, leadership potential uh, of the lead entrepreneur and the management team is critical. So these are quotes from various sources. I've uh, provided the references here to you. Um, but the team is the principal consideration um, for getting financing. And that's a concept that's hard to teach investigators. Um, I tried for many, many years, sometimes successful, many times not, um, but you'll see the data. Um, so in the tech area, the two or the first um, hurdle, if you will, to get through due diligence is the team. Um, if an investigator isn't confident in the ability of the CEO or the management team, they are likely not even to look at the market opportunity um, unless there's been an indication up front uh, that there will be a need for management. But then you need to be talking to investigators who are willing to do, I'm sorry, investors who are willing to do the complete assembly work. So again, it's team first, it's market opportunity second, uh, and then it's data. Remember that data that I keep talking about, right? Competition, what are the competitive advantages? How do you create a monopoly, right? This, these are fields that move so fast. How do you create um, a de facto monopoly? Uh, what's the operational plan? What are the milestones? Uh, IP uh, is of lesser importance. Um, certainly in software, um, in my view, it's of no importance uh, that, you know, a copyright uh, and maintaining um, proprietary rights through copyright um, as a trade secret far more important than patents uh, in the software space. And then finally, can the investor make money? What's the capital structure? What's the exit and analysis? How much will be required to get from where you are to where you want to go? And what are the um, acquisition prices um, for companies in a similar space? Uh, on the life sciences team, it is virtually the same, team first, team critically, and science and clinical data, which really is a reflection of the market opportunity. It's hard to distinguish uh, between science, clinical data, and the market opportunity, what the competition is, what are the alternative approaches to address the problem. Uh, IP is of more importance here, especially if you have uh, composition of matter. Uh, patents that uh, should protect a, a class of future compounds. Uh, regulatory and reimbursement process. Um, one of the difficulties today in trying to raise capital for diagnostics 
or um, devices is the un are, are the uncertainties related to uh, regulatory approval and reimbursement um, very difficult today uh, to obtain new capital for a new company uh, in the diagnostics or device space. And then finally, again, capital structure and exit analysis. And again, if there are questions about any of these issues, please get them in there uh, and we'll try to address them. So um, what's the funnel look like? So I will tell you that uh, these are data um, from a very interesting report that we'll show you the reference to uh, published just last year. Um, so uh, using a 250 number for the numbers of opportunities pitched or at least considered, um, about one in five of those got to actually meet um, with management of fund. Um, you know, one in 10, less than one in 10 get to actually meet partners. So again, your entry point um, for venture fund funding as an analyst or associate um, after internal discussions, if that project looks investable, it will get bumped uh, up to partners and you'll meet with partners. Um, uh, about one in two of those opportunities then go on to be, uh, go into what's called deep diligence or high level diligence. Uh, and then one in two, uh, 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 one in two or so, one in three of those are actually offered a financing term sheet. Uh, and then one or two of those actually gets financing. So it is a, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a long, tough road. So here again, our data. Um, so you can see the team is by far the most important factor for making an investment selection, right? And that's true across all fields and all stages. Uh, it's certainly true, most true for early stage technologies um, and very true in healthcare, <laughs> excuse me, and in IT as well, where the market opportunity is much bigger. Uh, then uh, far below that, um, with the exception of healthcare, is the, um, is the product opportunity. Um, so uh, let's move now to um, talking about some Osage. Some of you uh, know all about Osage, others don't, so I'll do this very briefly and give us some time for questions. So we've partnered with uh, about 90 institutions today, most in the U.S., but a few in Israel, Canada, and Asia. Um, and we work with our investigators to have, I'm sorry, institutional partners um, to insert into their licenses uh, a right that is often inserted. We certainly did at Penn in all of our deals called a participation right, a contractual right to invest downstream downstream to preserve um, our equity that is not be diluted. But for all the right reasons, institutions rarely um, invest their own capital. And that I think is smart, right? It's hard enough to run an academic institution without also trying to play venture capitalist. Um, so here's our team. We're finally at uh, fully staffed. Um, just to give you a sense of how long it takes to do these things. I retired from Penn 2005 started working on this, made my first pitch um, to the lead partner at Osage, I'm sorry, well, to the lead analyst then uh, at Osage in 2007, um, and we started, we made our first investment in 2009, and so we're coming up to our 10th year anniversary. Um, so we invest in disruptive science, right? Uh, we focus on companies or soon to be companies developing transformative technology that solve major global challenges led by passionate entrepreneurs. We have made investments at the seed stage uh, in technologies without management teams, without entrepreneurs, without CEOs, but only when there was a clear uh, recognition, indication, and expression from the lead investigator that together we would look and recruit and retain someone uh, to be the commercial um, front, if you will, face uh, of the organization. Um, we have 17 partners that uh, grant us their rights exclusively, not to invest in their deals, but simply that they're free to invest with whoever they want, do a lead, do a startup with anybody they want. 
Uh, but when there is a participation right, we have the exclusive right to exercise those, and um, it's a distinguished group. And we're pleased that um, all eight of the original university partners rejoined in Fund 2. We're now at Fund 2. $315 million, uh, uh, million dollars under management across uh, both funds. And then you can see here we brought in additional um, funds. Um, we have additional partners that we call associate partners. These are not exclusive relationships. Uh, this is simply a relationship where we have a memorandum of understanding that we're going to work together and try to look for opportunities uh, to invest. Um, we have a very strong group of co-investors. One of the things that we do uh, last year, we did made 202 introductions to other VCs to join us in co-investing uh, in technologies in new companies. Uh, this is what the portfolios now looks like, combined one and two. You can see on the bottom, those are our exits. Uh, about half of those are really good exits. About half of those uh, we've lost money on. Um, that's the nature of the game. Um, but you can see we're active in both on the tech side uh, as well as the life sciences side. Here's you can see it by stage. So we've made um, investments in seven companies at the seed stage. Uh, by far the most active round of investment is the Series A, but we've also invested in later stage rounds. Um, and you can see lie highlighted in green, those are our exits. So by and large, those come from investments made at later stages. So here are the references um, and those bubbles I presented and talking about the importance of management. Um, and then uh, some additional references or resources uh, that if you need to study, need to learn more about how to create a startup, company structures, how to create boards, what due diligence is, um, model legal documents from the National Venture Capital Association, all of that's there. Um, here's an article that is my um, patented solution to insomnia. Start reading this. I promise you'll go to sleep. Um, here's another article targeted more towards attorneys who are working with institutions thinking about how to invest capital in this space. Uh, and here's the team and our contact information. So um, thank you for the opportunity. We got through it um, in a little more than 30 minutes, and I'm pleased to take any questions you have. Uh, Debbie, it's back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lou. At this time, we will conduct a question and answer session. So if you have any, go ahead and use the public chat box towards the bottom of your screen and go ahead and post your questions, and we'll take them in the order that they are received. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to invite you to our next professional development program, which is taking place on May 16th. And this program is titled Connecting University Research to Industry Funding Sources. This is a case study of the Penn State Innovation Gateway. This session will provide a deep dive into the concept, development, funding, and management of the Innovation Gateway app, which is being held as a major advancement into the partnering of Penn State research and industry needs. And you can find out more information about this program by visiting www.techtransfercentral.com. And a link to the session is located under the Upcoming Webinars tab, which is at the top left of the home page. Lou, I don't see any questions at this time. I'm going to turn it back to you for any um, additional remarks before we close the session. No, I'm looking at the attendee list. I, uh, I've had the pleasure um, of knowing some of these folks. Again, feel free uh, to reach out now with questions or uh, come back later to me directly on email if you have Thank some you. questions. But, uh, Thank you for the opportunity and um, look forward to seeing you at some future event. Thank you, Lou. And actually, we did just have a question come in. It says, how would academics pull together a team? Yeah. Um, so the, the greatest single challenge in launching startups is exactly that. Um, no one yet has come up with a real good way of doing that. Um, the uh, obvious but not necessarily uh, actionable answer is you've got a network. Um, and so uh, let me ask the question, what is the, whoever asked that question, what is your location, geographic location? I believe it's Pennsylvania. Well, in Pennsylvania, um, so 
uh, there's a, a, a great deal of re resource available. So um, the Ben Franklin Technology Partnership, uh, there are incubation accelerator programs throughout the regions. Uh, you've got to start meeting people. You've got to get out, um, whether that's done by the investigator or uh, the, uh, one of the tech transfer people. Um, but the only way to do that is start meeting people. Ask for some introductions. Um, there is an initiative underway that Osage is part of uh, to experiment trying to create a pool of investable entrepreneurs and a pool of technologies that we think are worthy for investment, uh, but that's still in its early phases. Um, you could ask uh, attorneys in the region that you work with uh, who, who might be involved, who are the angel folks involved. Uh, you might have to start with an angel investor uh, who's willing to take it on while it's still a science project and early R&D. Uh, but the short answer to that is you've got a network and it's tough. Um, but, but I will tell you, um, so as many of you know, I'm old. Um, the most important decision, lifetime decision, any individual makes, in my opinion, is their selection of a life partner. If you're an academic entrepreneur, the second most important decision in your life is who your commercial co-founder is going to be. Uh, it's a decision that needs to be taken um, very carefully uh, in a disciplined manner, and the only way you do that is to get out there and kiss a lot of frogs. Thank you very much. I'm going to give the audience uh, one more moment for final call for questions and uh, just remind them that, again, for those in the audience who are eligible for continuing legal education credits, today's program number is 5217. That concludes our program for today. I don't see any other questions coming in, uh, Luz. I just wanted to, again, thank you so much for this highly valuable program and all of its takeaways. And to the audience, thank you for attending today. We look forward to continuing to serve your professional development needs. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you.